Welcome to BizTech's Technology Show, the show where we feature tech companies operating across Asia, talking about their solutions and how they make a difference to their customers' businesses. Today, we speak to Peter Eckard, co-founder and chief experience officer at Project 202. Now, welcome to the show, Peter. Thanks for having me. Now, Peter, for a start, give us an overview of Project 202, your history, and also that very unusual name. Yes, I do my best. Um, Project 202 was founded in 2003, and um, it is our belief that um, technology is ever evolving, and therefore we thought it will be a never-ending project for us, and so we chose the name Project uh, as the company name, and then uh, 202 stands for two and two friends coming together to get the uh, company off the ground. Our services are all about um, customer experience definition, customer experience design and development, and customer experience go-to-market services. When did you decide uh, and why did you decide to come to Asia? Because you've set on an office first in Colombia, your first one out of the US. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, about three years ago, uh, we were operating predominantly in North America and um, just started expanding. We just had acquired a small group uh, inside uh, the east part of the US. And uh, we started getting requests from this region to help um, creating better experiences for some large companies. And so uh, we were trying to deliver on, on our services promise um, from the US, which um, it became quickly uh, uh, quickly clear that it's very difficult to do this uh, over a time gap of 12 hours. So we decided to invest and double down and go to this region. Um, and I, I'm kind of spearheading that movement for us. Okay, and 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 give us some insights into your your scope of products and services or, or that you offer in Asia. Um, well, we. Uh, our our service offering is kind of end to end if the businesses that we're engaging with have a larger customer experience challenge most businesses that come to us they have some some problem identified in uh, any of their customer experiences or in their larger strategy for their customers and in that end to end kind of scenario we do everything from understanding what the core problem is and what the core customer needs are, and then designing uh, uh, and creating new innovation, build it. Um, so we do the actual building of these uh, products and then help go to market with it. Um, so that service offering is the same anywhere we go because it's, it's a people business. All we do is like imagine new things, build new things, and we can do this pretty much in any city on the planet if we want to. Okay, and I'm going to come back to you a little, a little bit about that, but which are the customer segments that you actually service and who are your key clients currently? So, oh yeah. so we have 250 projects at any given time where we're trying to address some customer experience problems. We are basically in every industry. And the reason for this is the the problem statement around customer experience is so brand new. It's maybe only 15, 20 years old. But it, it didn't exist before then. The, the problem statement is so new that many of these large organizations struggle to curate all their experiences um, throughout the whole business. So think about a, a big company that has retail environments, that has online services, that has like mobile apps. These are all experienced touch points for the exactly same customer, yet these businesses treat them as separate things. So the, the, it, it's, it's disconnected and disjointed. So whenever we have an experience that doesn't seem seamless, that's when we come in and help addressing those things and, and kind of bridge the gap. And Peter, so, so this so is it's, not something which is a US problem. This is a global issue. Customer experience and user, uh, user experience or what techies call CX and UX are basically things which are neglected and have been neglected for a long time. Why is that? Companies are willing to spend lots of money on the deep tech 
but on the front end user experience, which is where you, you engage your customers, they yes. tend to shy away from that. Yeah, so there's like two major things about this, what you're just describing. So number one is it's misunderstood what CX or UX actually is. It's, it, it's seen as this visual improvement of things or you know a little bit of magic sprinkled on top <laughs> some some sizzle and coolness factor it's completely misunderstood what this domain can provide for you as a business and how it enables you to have better innovation how it enables you to run uh, your operations more smoothly how it uh, avoids ha having uh, r d waste you know and so that so the market as a whole doesn't understand it very well because it's so young the other problem is for for the longest time technology companies come to these businesses and tell them that they need to invest into technology and so most organizations start with the idea of technology then try to adopt the technology within their own business and change the business access to the technology and then last they try to force that new uh, paradigm onto the customers, which in our mind is the opposite way of how you should be doing this. You should be first understanding your core customer needs, then you should address what your business can do for those needs and the services you need to provide and the products you need to provide, and then you should choose the technology that will enable those experiences and, and, and let those experiences um, come to life. The problem is that there's many, many technology companies out there that are trying to still do it the old way, you know, buy technology and the rest will be easy, you know. So, so then how do you get them to change their mindsets? Because as I said, this is not a problem that uh, has not been identified and it is a global problem among large companies. So when we started this like almost 20 years ago the the conversation was very difficult because this was so brand new and when we we base a lot of things in in um, uh, behavioral science of customers so what they do and how they behave and why they do it and so nobody really was looking at this at that time nowadays there's shining examples where great experiences have delivered great business results so companies started to notice so companies starting to wonder okay so what are they doing different than we are doing you know why are they uh, performing better why is there a disruptor coming out of nowhere you know how is that possible we also have technology why is ours not connecting and so they're starting to ask these questions and then that's our that's our entry point to have a conversation which is all around like well do you truly understand your customer it's not just a segmentation. What, who are your core customers? You know, and what are their core needs? Many people still have this idea that a feature will address your core need, but it needs to be also addressing emotional needs. It needs to be addressing aspirational needs. So it's a complex proposition. And we now have delightful experiences everywhere in our life. It's the Netflixes of this world, the grabs of this world that make us all want better experiences, even if we go to work. Yeah, so our expectations have now gone to a completely different level and because of those brands like Netflix I and mean, globally you turn on a switch and you expect it to magically appear if it doesn't that's when then that's when you're surprised because your whole expectation is global delivery yeah you got it um and and it gets even more complex we have now we we have now some massive projects with large organizations that cannot attract talent anymore because they don't have the right tools for for the younger workforces to come into an, an organization and wanting to stay because the tools are outdated the 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 technology you provide for people to just get their job done is outdated so we do a lot of internal customer experiences now people that are things that nobody out there really sees that is for you when you have to get your job done at your uh, at your office you know so it's um we, we call it we're living in the age of experiences and the standard keeps rising and when you have these delightful experiences you don't want subpar anymore it's pretty straightforward now peter you have clients in financial services you also have clients in the automotive sector you, you work with people like tesla give us some concrete examples of how you've helped your clients 
Yeah, so we, you know, uh, we have, of course, um, shiny, exciting companies like Disney Plus and Tesla and so on. But um, if you really peel back the onion, they all have the identical challenge, which is, how do I understand my customer better? How do I understand better how the customer behaves? And how do I give them an experience that will be simple, intuitive, and delightful? And those are kind of the key aspects of this. So you can now go to any industry, any company, and you can ask any business, basically, do you understand your customers well? If you do, then you can give them better experiences. You just need to do the necessary techniques to, to get it to life. But most businesses actually don't spend time going outside of their own walls to truly understand their customers. They, they collect a lot of quantitative data, um, but you also need qualitative data. And without qualitative data, you're basically just guessing what will stick. Okay, so Peter, one of the things that I'm assuming from what you've just told us is actually this. Your teams obviously have to be multidisciplinary. Walk us through your methodology. I mean, how, how do you actually yeah. arrive at what needs to be done? Yeah, so the very first step, and it doesn't take very long, is revealing the actual business reality that the, a company is in. That is everything from their internal skill set, their strategy, their technology spend and investment, and their competition. And then last but not least, you know, customers. So we're, we're diagnosing essentially a business around those five dimensions and, and discovering what is truly your ailment. Many organizations think they have a problem, but they're only treating the symptoms. And then, you know, we need to get at the underlying problem. From there, it becomes actually very focused um, because you can be uh, very crisp and fast with your innovation cycles. Now that we know the problem, now we can quickly iterate um, and, and design something new. And, and many times is actually just adjusting existing things. You know, like we have an experience that is not performing, we just up-level it. We, we, we create a better experience on top of the old one and, and then we're already helping the business. And then the rest becomes very straightforward agile design and development. Okay, now I wanna ask you, what, what's, what's the key differentiator between global innovators and disruptors? and the UI of your run-of-the-mill average multinational company. What yeah. are some of the secret sauce that they possess that the average company doesn't possess? They have understood that the design domain as a whole is a really important function in their business and have that, that unit that unit has some real power. So they have a seat at the table on the highest level. So um, you can go to Gartner and Forrester, they have this index that they're tracking and, you know, and some other groups as well. Basically design-led organizations outpace all other organizations by multiple hundred percentage points. Yeah, and, and Apple is the, your, your gold standard of that. Yeah, and so, Design has real power. They're not, they're not baked inside a technology group. Many organizations, even if they invest into experienced design professionals, they anchor them wrong. They don't empower them to actually make real product decisions. They don't let them actually do the necessary research around their customer base. So these shiny examples like Apple have well understood how powerful the design thinking techniques are. And they have these units inside their business uh, with real power. You know, that's really the, the big difference. Okay, now what advice could you give um, organizations and governments who are always talking about digitization? And this is a buzzword, especially in Asia now. Digitization, we need to do a leapfrog. Uh, we want to future-proof and modernize. So I'm using all these bu buzzwords. Yeah, yeah. But what advice would you give them to really kind of Go back to 101 and start. What are the key things they need to look at? Yeah, so digitize, digitization or digitalization is in itself not necessarily going to make the business better. You know, what it does is it collects what was manual processes, things on paper, and digitizes them, right? And so you now can do processes a little bit more efficient. You know, you collect the data, you store the data, before that was all on paper, right? So it's a necessary step, but it doesn't necessarily deliver more innovation because of it, or it doesn't necessarily 
be more elegant now and the process may be more cumbersome just because you invested into technology. So the number one thing that we advise our customers on is you need to get to the core needs of your customers. The core needs are not just functional, they're emotional and aspirational. If you do not identify those three layers of needs, you can basically not innovate properly anymore. If you, if you do know these, innovation becomes actually very easy because you know exactly what will matter for this customer. You can ignore feature load. You can actually focus on the things that will make a difference in that human being's life. And you can save money in the process because you can go to market faster. So uh, it's all just related to the core needs of the, of the human being. You know, when you talk about pizza, core means of the uh, 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 needs of the human being. I always think back to Amazon's one click. Because mm -hmm. what we really need as individuals is simplicity and ease of use, rather than as, as I'm going to take your word up, feature bloat, which is, which is becoming more and more apparent these days. Yeah, and there's also this emergence. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with you, but there's like, um, they, <laughs> This is kind of like what marketing does to us, right? Um, we think we need more, but in reality, we don't. I, you know, uh, we want simple mechanisms. We know how to do a light switch. If we have 20 switches side by side, we wouldn't remember anymore which switch does what, right? And so it's a very simple example. Look at Grab. Grab started beautifully with uh, this model of ride sharing. Everyone got it. It was super simple to engage. And now Grab wants to do this super app. And people are starting to be confused because you're overloading. It's we call, we call that cognitive load. You're overloading a human's capacity to actually handle multiple things at the same time. And on top of that, you're interfering with their mental model. I'll, I'll give you a super simple example. The right share button is next to the insurance button. It makes no sense because in our heads, we don't file these things in the same place, right? When we think about insurance, we behave different. When we think yes. about car, we behave different. We are in completely different emotional states depending on this. Buying insurance is completely different than doing a right. So right? Peter, what you are advocating then is a complete redesign of these super apps, whether it's it's Grab, whether it's Gojack, whether it's... Uh, 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 you know, an app in China. So it's interesting. So first of all, the train has left the station on many of these super apps. The leaderships of these groups are wanting to consolidate their business units into one place. And it's a mistake. It is better to be more focused and have maybe one or two companion apps with, with your larger app, you know, um, but the, the train has left. So they're, they're right now on this rampage of doing these things. And eventually we will have to break this back down until it becomes more digestible again. It, it just takes one niche player that focuses again on the thing that really made the difference, which is simplicity. You said it, you know? So in other words, Peter, what you're also then advocating then is the following, which is an interesting thought. It, in, in the tech business, there's this whole mindset of, which has been proven in the past from a business model perspective, winner take all. So this is what basically they've all invested in because there will be only maybe two people standing and the rest will die. What you're saying is you're advocating a completely different strategy for the attacker. The attacker then goes into niche industries or niche segments and then just becomes really good at it and they can still beat the giant. 100% and, and what is niche actually, you know, if you take any given problem that we have in life, you know, any, any mechanism that is cumbersome and someone comes around and just comes up with an idea concept to address one of those pain points. Um, you know, if you, if you look at, at the ride sharing uh, companies of this world, the problem was that we were sitting in shoddy taxis that were dirty and it wasn't a good experience. Yes. And someone just thought, this is dumb. Let's just connect all the people that have great cars, let them move around other people, and let's put this on an app. Brilliant idea, right? It completely disrupted the taxi industry. Let me tell you this. 
there's so many industries out there that have still these old outdated processes that are cumbersome takes just one idea to address and there's plenty of disruption uh, opportunity out there still it doesn't have to be super niche um, but niche definitely um, can help um, but that doesn't mean that you you can't become really big with this you know think about it gross buying grocery is still weird you know and getting it delivered to your home is getting better you know so there's an area you know hospitals healthcare sector how many times when you go to the doctor do you still have to fill out the paper form every single time even if it's the same doctor yeah. you know so there's so many bro broken things still out there you know there's plenty of opportunity to disrupt now peter then in that case what are some nuggets of advice that you would give if i'm a large company i'm starting out and i want to really do three or four things really well very quickly to move the needle on my customer experience and user experience what should i be focusing on yeah so the first step is self-diagnosis right you need to map out what that experience is today most businesses mistake their sales funnel as the customer experience but the customer experience is actually what the human being that is the customer is trying to get accomplished by the time I come to your e-commerce site, I already had an evaluation process in my head. I already looked at things that I might want to buy. So there's this is the whole experience. So documenting what that experience is is quite important because then you can see where you're what you're doing for the customer experience and where you're falling short. It's really easy to understood, right? You, you can self-diagnose yourself. Second step is you need to understand why people do certain things. Uh, for example, if your business has um, lo a losing customer base, you know, um, you want to understand why that is. So you need to go out and you, you need to meet those people and try to understand why they didn't buy, why they didn't click that button. Is it a breakdown in the experience? Is it because the product is too pricey? Is it confusing? You need to understand the why. Many businesses only look at quantitative data, which essentially only tells you what is happening, but you also need to know why it is happening. And so once you have those two data sets, you can actually synthesize for innovation, synthesize for improvements in your, in your breakdowns, and synthesize for uh, new features, or uh, in most cases, actually reduction of features. Now, Peter, you have been in um, uh, Asia since last year. What's your Asia strategy? Yes, so um, we just acquired a business and we will have offices in Malaysia, Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand, and we will announce this in a week. And um, once we have settled in these initial countries, we would like to take our services to most of the countries in the region because every single country are emerging societies that are avid users of technology. And so there's there's a lot of need to help these countries to have, have better experiences. So our expansion is pretty much every country in this region. Um, and, and the biggest obstacle for us uh, to accomplish this is actually talent. All of these places in this region have an immature educational proposition when it comes to this field. So there's no university that that educates UX designers. You know, there's no university that that educates experienced researchers. You know, there's no such thing. So we need to a help these universities in these countries to develop a curriculum, and we need to find promising talent, and we need to help that talent to learn about. All the things that are necessary and there's a lot of techniques and um, i'm not sure uh, if you're familiar with the term design thinking but okay. it's like a framework around using certain techniques to or organize the creative process and help a business to innovate with it you know and um that is i think the biggest problem having the talent um, and educating them talent and the market um, that will prevent us from expanding faster i think now, Peter, it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you very much for taking your time to be on the show. Thanks you for having me. Now, I'm Brian Fernandez, and I've been speaking to Peter Eckert, the co-founder and chief experience officer of Project 202 on BizTech's technology show. This video will be on our various social media platforms, as well as our website, www.biztech.asia. Please subscribe and like our various platforms. 
Thanks again for tuning in.